So looking at the effects of genes and behavior, it's a wonder we can even tease apart these two things. Um, trying to figure out what's more important, the behavior or the uh, environment or the uh, genetic component is something that behavioral geneticists do, and they are, again, part of psychology. So there are four major um, designs or approaches to study not whether there is an interaction, but what is playing a bigger role. Is it genes or is it behavior? Or sorry, the environment. And we are looking at every trait that you could possibly think of, mental, um, such as personality, outgoingness, extroversion, um, you know, intelligence, all those things, plus physical features as well. What is the most important component? Is it nature or is it nurture? The way that these geneticists do this, or behavioral geneticists, and behavioral geneticists, of course, behavior, environment, gen genetics, you know, genes, is through family studies, adoption studies, twin studies, or combined. So I'm going to go through each one of these to, to um, <coughs> talk about what this means. First of all, we have to be able to understand that in order to do this kind of research, family studies, twin studies, adoption studies, we have to be sure that the trait is actually heritable, that it's passed on from one generation to another. And now the best way to determine whether a gene is due to, or whether a behavior is due to genes or not, is through selective breeding, such as with dogs, right, or other animals that we breed, or plants. But we can't do this with humans. We can't go get a pile of people in a sample and say, okay, I want to see if this particular trait is heritable, <coughs> meaning genetic. <coughs> so I want you two to mate, and then you two to mate. It might sound like fun. Actually, that would be an orgy, right? But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless this is not experimentally uh, supported. Uh, number one, that's kind of like eugenics. This is what bad people wanted to do a long time ago <laughs> for intelligence. Um, so this is not something that we engage in, eugenics. So it's typically reserved only for breeding certain qualities that you want in dogs. And actually, dogs used to be wolves, right? And look at them now. I mean, would you bring a wolf into your house? Now they are, you know, we've, we've actually bred them to be very docile and man's best, human's best friend, sorry. So um, we can find a trait that we're interested in, such as a guard dog. And of course, then you get things like, you know, uh, Rottweilers and those kinds of dogs, where you get somebody who is, uh, not someone, a dog, who is a more, uh, let's say, good for hunting, and so you would have a retriever, right? So all these kinds of qualities we can identify and then breed and select it uh, based on, again, crossbreeding, but we can't do it in humans. We do it, though, to a sense, don't we? Do we not engage in selective breeding to some degree? Don't we? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We seek out those traits that we like in our partners. And we don't consciously say, oh, I want my children to have your blue eyes or your brown eyes, or I want my children to have your IQ or your muscular build and that six-pack that you're carrying around. I don't mean the beer that you're carrying. But, you know, we do, we do tend to um, look for qualities that we desire. And in a sense, we are unconsciously engaging in selective breeding. So, uh, you know, at, at some level, it does occur. It's getting worse, though. What do I mean by that? It's going to actually be something that's going to be very dangerous in the future. What's happening on the horizon? Uh, genetic engineering. Genetic engineering. Going to pick out your baby from a catalog. Can you imagine it? And picking out the genes that you would like to have. And of course, when you people are donating sperm, you can do all these kinds of genetics analysis and pick out what you want. I want to have my child to be, you know, six foot tall. I want a male. I want them to have brown eyes or blue eyes, or the case may be, uh, you know, athletic ability and select it. And this is going to be a problem. Yeah. He was murdered. <laughs> was he? Do you know his name? So, oh, okay, so he needed to do an IQ test or only people who had high profile. So like a, the elite sperm bank. Yeah, okay. Wow. That, that's, that's 
practicing you, that's eugenics. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, we're, we're getting. We can do it now. We can do it now, right? You can pick. You can pick your sex now if you wanted to. But this is again the whole idea. Should we, because we can, just because we can, should we be doing this? Um, one of my friends is going through like an abuse process. Yep. Yeah, this is a problem. I mean, this is a real problem. We're going to be mutants. Because think about, you think about genetics. If you're care we all have four or five lethal recessive genes, and the whole idea why we are genetically pre-wired to be disgusted with incest is because it protects us from that kind of, you know. But on the other hand, there may be good genes. So it's not all bad for, for you know, in-house in breeding, so to speak. I mean, the... the, the uh, uh, royalty does it all the time, but I mean, look at them, they're all messed up, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I can see that, I can see that. And the other thing I heard too was, um, I don't know where I heard this on the internet or somewhere, that they've identified this, this man, I don't know how they did it, but um, he actually, they, they, they did the, you know, the stats on it, you could do this kind of statistics, and they figured out that he actually fathered close to 400 babies. He was a sperm donor. I guess he liked to do it, right? It was his hobby. Um, so in any event, a good job if you can get it, right? He, um, yeah, he had, they say he fathered to about 400 children. I mean, that's just crazy. So. Well, that's what she's saying. Cause there's a lot of yeah. that where like fathers are, like, yeah. you know, producing 400 children. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I, I liken it to that. Anyone ever here read the story uh, Frankenstein? Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's not about the monster, all right? It's not about that. It's about crea science creating something because you're curious, and we do. We're now at points where we're going into stem cell research. We're going into these, you know, engineering of genetics because we're curious. And you can't stop science, right? Regardless of ethics, you can sit down with a bioethicist all you want. It's going to happen anyway in the cellars of basements, right? It's going to happen in people's labs. It always has, and it always will continue to do so. But curiosity sometimes will create this monster, and then it will come back and uh, you know the proverbial you know bite you on the ass, right? And that's what can happen is you create this scientific product, but then it comes back and will you know be end up being your demise. So this is kind of the problem with science is that we're going into areas that are uncharted, and it's happening so fast that the ethics can't keep up with it. But you know, you, you can be the way we're doing with eggs now, freezing your eggs, and somebody else can have your your baby for you. And you know, someone once said to me, "You can be your own grandpa, right? I'm my own grandpa um, because, because uh, you can't keep track of all this. You know, woman carrying the baby for her daughter, and oh my God, it just gets really crazy. And you hear about all these stories, right? And they're they're real. So in any event, um, selective breeding it's on the horizon. Be at a, you know, at a store coming soon near you. <laughs> um, family studies, and again, this is uh, looking at your genetic overlap with your relatives. And the idea in family studies is a, it's correlation, again, and you can never assume causation with, with correlation. But what they try to do is, let's say there is some risk factor in your family, your genetic line, or your, your family tree, so to speak. And they would look back and see who it is or how close genetically related you are to that person. And if you are highly genetically related, so let's say your twin brother or your twin sister or your biological sibling, um, your, you know, as you get further removed, so let's say cousins, aunts, second cousins, great grandparents, then the reduction should decrease. So if the risk shows you have a greater risk with the greater shared genetics, then that suggests that it's a genetic component. I'm just going to show you a slide that makes this a little bit more easy to understand. This is a hypothetical situation for schizophrenia, the risk of developing schizophrenia. 
And over here, what you have is your degree of relatedness, genetic relatedness, how much genes you share with that particular person. So again, this relates to 100% with your identical twin, 50% would be your first degree relatives and your brothers and sisters or your children, right? You share roughly half of your DNA. As you become further removed, the percentage drops in roughly about half, right? So 25% you share with your grandchildren, nephews, nieces, and 12.5% with your third degree relatives who you may not even know who they are, right? So what the idea here is that the more you share, that the risk of developing should also be higher. And if the risk of developing decreases in the same ratio as the genetic relatedness, that might suggest a genetic component. And as you can see here, as we start to move from 100% to 50 to 25 on this graph, we tend to show the same decrease. It mimics what's going on over here with genetic relatedness. What's the problem with this? We're saying, ah, oh, here we go. This proves that, you know, this particular trait, in this case uh, schizophrenia, has a genetic basis. Because clearly, as we start to decrease in genetic relatedness, the risk of developing disorder also decreases, and roughly by half. We're not counting for environmental factors. So I could be the devil's advocate and say, this has nothing to do with genes. Because if you look at this, <coughs> not only do we share this percentage of genetic relatedness, we also share this kind of similarity in our environmental relatedness. So most often you're going to live with these people, right, for most part of your life. These people, probably not, and especially now where they may not be in the same city, and these people, you may only have them from photo albums, if at all. So the argument is it could be the environment that's exhibiting most of the influence on this particular trait, right? You see that? Right? The other thing is, if you look at the chart, if this were totally genetic, then somebody who has schizophrenia, identical twin, should not be showing 48% relatedness or risk. They should be showing what? 100%, percent. <coughs> exactly. So we're only accounting for half when we look at the genes. 52% is coming from somewhere else. So you still have that environmental component, which is huge, right? Huge.